So, hello to everybody. My name is Roman Globoker, and I will now lead this panel discussion. Um, we have heard a lot of uh, very interesting thoughts and reflections, and also uh, we, uh, we heard some experiences. And uh, this panel discussion is uh, dedicated uh, to, to have uh, more uh, feedback from the field of uh, research or for the, from the field of psychology, uh, psychiatric uh, uh, work, and also uh, pastoral theological work. So it's more practical um, uh, point of view in this um, uh, uh, topic of free will, determinism, um, and uh, a brain. So our first speaker is Professor Dr. Ivo Cermak. He's professor of psychology at the Faculty of Social Studies at Masaryk University in Brno. And the title of his uh, statement now uh, is story told by several traumatized girl in also is also expression of free will. Uh, Professor Cermak, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, the question uh, that was uh, chosen for this uh, round table uh, namely, what is uh, the connection uh, between the physical determination, especially brain functioning uh, of a human being and his or her freedom, seems to be uh, significant in light of uh, the rapid development of neuroimaging methods uh, uh, for several reasons. Um, in scientific discourse, the view is being promoted that the moment is approaching when we will uh, penetrate uh, the secret uh, nooks of the brain workings to such an extent or depth that other interpretive frameworks such as psychological theories, philosophical reflections, or uh, theological uh, maxims will no longer be needed. Some scientists, for example, talk about the moral brain, which on the one hand uh, can be seen as a metaphor, but uh, we know all, all too well how uh, insidiously seductive metaphors can be. Metaphors not only facilitate the creativity of our thinking and approach to the world, but they can also evoke uh, the uh, powerful idea uh, that uh, the answers to complex questions of morality, moral decision-making and actions or feeling lie within the brain and the knowledge of its workings. Uh, from this general consideration supported by increasingly sophisticated neuroimaging tools and fascinating findings, uh, it is only a step to the view that the decision about a moral act is completed in the brain before it is spoken and before it is acted upon. Uh, these metaphors in their, uh, in their intended or unintended consequences deprive man of his uh, free will. Um, there is a myriad uh, of methods in personality assessment, and one group is a so-called projective or a perception test. The oldest uh, and most widely used of them is the thematic perception test, TAT, which is being used by psychologists more than 80 years. <clears throat> Clients are asked to tell a story about a small set of black and white pictures. Without going into the nuances of the various already existing interpretative approaches, it can be it can be said, based upon many years of experience and research, that such kind of stories will reveal aspects of human nature that may otherwise remain unknown or silent. This systematic approach of storytelling has provided methods to investigate those originally and highly personal topics that constitutes the unique personality of each individual. We can say that the stories evoked by uh, TAT are life stories. TAT elicits information about inner clients, private words, about his or her intentions, motivations, and so on. Generally speaking, we can interpret TAT stories from the form uh, 
form perspective which relates to how the story teller is organizing his or her experience into stories evoked by TA team, pictures, and we naturally can consider also the content of the story, which refers to the specific uh, themes reflected unique uh, unique uh, intentions or concerns of storyteller. Um, I would um, I would like to show you with a simple uh, example from research and uh, therapeutic and assessment practice uh, that we uh, cannot be satisfied with uh, a neurocognitive framework alone. Um, uh, this, this is um, one of the pictures used for story evoking in our research and psychological assessment. Um, I would like to emphasize that uh, TAT story could only be obtained in the context of, of uh, the uh, focused, um, complex psychological treatment. Um, the story, this, this, this one, the story was told by severely and repeatedly, mostly sexually abused uh, adolescent girl during her early childhood. Such a cruel trauma uh, pervasively influenced her behaviors uh, feelings, relations to people and personality development. She was uh, succumbing to sudden aggressive outbursts and dissociative flashbacks. She suffered from strong anxiety and depression. Uh, we could observe um, on the one hand, her fear of sexuality. On the other hand, uh, there were, uh, there were uh, situations in which she behaved erotically challenging. She perceived human interaction as hostile and malevolent, and she was prone to approach um, relationships and social rules from self-gratification and intense self-concern. We also found uh, that she had a small capacity for emotional, uh, emotional investment into uh, relationships. And uh, she uh, suffered from, uh, from uh, many uh, other, uh, other troubles. Um, uh, it is um, from from this from this uh, 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 story. Um, it is uh, it is apparent that girl is having considerable trouble to create uh, the story. In uh, in our um, in our research, uh, we found that severely traumatized girls find it difficult to uh, conceptualize a story. They have troubles in describing relationships. The form of story was rather fragmented. They often interrupted storytelling due to tra traumatic uh, uh, flashbacks that uh, suddenly burst out. And um, our fi findings are spotted uh, by uh, the similar studies of other uh, author as well, authors as well. Um, At this point, it, it would seem that the functioning of uh, the brain is so impaired that the, these conditions hinder the girl from telling a meaningful, coherent story. And indeed, uh, in a few studies uh, through uh, uh, fMRI, uh, brain activity of traumatized uh, women during storytelling has been uh, uh, monitored and compare with the brain activity of uh, women who didn't report a history of traumatic experience. It was found that uh, different brain areas were activated during storytelling in traumatized and non-traumatized uh, women. Uh, it was even possible to identify uh, uh, images that were more sensitive in relation to the trauma experienced. However, uh, even such fascinating findings don't provide us with an argument for the claim that the brain is, 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 is primed to uh, make a decision for creating a particular kind of story. Rather, the story of our uh, traumatized girl uh, is an expression of her struggle to make sense of her horrific experience. Her, uh, it is expression of her effort to understand and integrate it into life. Uh, even in her fragmented story, we can find signs of free uh, intentionality. Her story is an expression of that intentionality and also a reflection of how her human interactions are based on such uh, free intentionality. Um, 
And uh, if we look at the story, uh, evoked by the same picture and told by the same girl after uh, several months of intensive therapy, uh, we can uh, clearly see uh, the change. Uh, the original uh, fragmented story has been transformed into a more meaningful form. The intentions of the characters appearing in the story bec become, um, became uh, clearer. Uh, the change itself uh, could not have taken place without uh, girls' free intentions. Her staying in long-term uh, contact with uh, uh, the therapists and her focus on coping with the traumatic uh, experience. And uh, for that, she needed uh, free will. Um, in the context of these findings, uh, the brain appears to be a necessary condition. A necessary condition, not a, not a, a vehicle for these changes. Um, it is a neurocognitive or neural uh, underpinning with the specific structures and processes that could shed light on how free will, storytelling, intentionality, or morality, uh, morality work. Um, so there are some uh, some some pictures of uh, uh, draw by by this girl uh, when she was in therapy. You can, you can see the fragmented picture, which is, which is also a, a, a expression of her, uh, her uh, uh, trauma experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Chermak, for your presentation. And now uh, we will uh, follow the presentation of uh, Professor Borut Skodler. He is a professor of uh, psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine, Un University of Ljubljana, and also director of one of the departments of the psychiatric clinic in Ljubljana. He's interested in phenomenological research into the experience of people with the psychotic experience and suicidality. Uh, and also he's interested in spirituality and meditation. So uh, Professor Skodler, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning to everybody. I'm sorry for not being able to be with you in person. I will shortly um, uh, describe my, my view, my take on, on the subject through the lens of schizophrenia. It is related uh, to many aspects to what Professor Cermak has told us about um, difficulties in storytelling. Um, both um, very traumatized people as well as schizophrenic individuals, both from prodromal stages onwards to the full-blown schizophrenia, they also have difficulties with building, constructing autobiographies or story, stories of their lives um, due to their specific problems. And as you know, schizophrenia is one of the most brain disorders, disordered among mental disorders, right? Schizophrenia being one of the paradigmatic psychotic disorders. It is also well researched as for the brain, um, neurobiological and neurodevelopmental perspectives. <clears throat> it is chronic brain disorder as they call it in some psychiatric circles. It is also uniquely human illness. Um, <clears throat> and what I would pinpoint from the neurobiological research is one aspect, namely that elevated dopamine 
in some parts of the brain um, is uh, causally related, as it seems, as it uh, um, as the research shows, to the um, what is called aberrant salience, um, as one of the researchers um, has put a hypothesis from it, and aberrant salience means that um, people experience outer um, stimuli, outer uh, sensory data, also intersubjective, interpersonal data too intensively. <clears throat> they they um, um, perceive the outer events as well as inner, um, inner um, uh, be it uh, thoughts, experiences, um, and so, as very important or salient for them. That means, as compared to the more usual type of experience that we share, most of us, we, we, if we are not uh, vulnerable to schizophrenia, we leave many data, many, many impressions, and many sensories, uh, sensations as not relevant and important. We, we simply put them into the tacit background dimension, and we can focus on, for example, now that, <clears throat> that I'm talking and you listen in, or to any other focus that we choose. Meanwhile, <clears throat> patients with schizophrenia are unable to filter out, to set aside, to put at the background um, sensory data. That, that means that they are hyper, um, <clears throat> they are overwhelmed constantly by them. That's why they in intersubjective inter and other situations uh, cannot cope with that. They they simply freeze, or they 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 feel like they cannot. They are paralyzed, inhibited totally, and that's also the reason why they withdraw. So, <clears throat> the main phenomenological research on schizophrenia show exactly the same. They they tell us the patients tell us they cannot uh, ward off or shelter themselves from the outside world. They are constantly overwhelmed by it. They feel um, uh, overwhelmed, consequently frozen, and um, they cannot be with others. Then they cannot focus on the interpersonal relationships. They also cannot focus on other activities that easily. So they, they have a constant struggle and constant fight with everyday life. <clears throat> I will tell you two short vignettes and then um, that show what I was now describing. And then I will come to the point of what can people vulnerable to schizophrenia do with that? How free they are to choose and construct and lead their lives. And I will show that by an example of a historical, an important historical figure that um, showed uh, somehow through his life struggle, how to cope with that. Uh, I will come by the end uh, to him. Uh, so first two, two short vignettes. First is a 19 year, they are both patients of mine. One is a 19 year old um, who came to our unit. I work in a, psychotherapy unit for psychotic, for schizophrenia patients. So he was in the so-called prodromal phase. That means he has never experienced a full-blown psychosis. So he was not yet diagnosed with schizophrenia, but all his clinical picture or his experiences show that he is on that um, track, so to say. And what is he experiences? Why we think he's on that track is that he feels constantly overwhelmed by any interaction with another human being. He feels overwhelmed by that interaction. He feels the other is using him, is manipulating him very easily. The threshold for that is very low. We all can think of somebody perhaps manipulating us, but he feels that with almost everybody, including his parents, 
his sister, his uh, close friends. So he feels this world is a cold, um, manipulative place, not worth living. And nihilistic worldview is a natural outcome for that. And he was treated in our unit, escaped from it. That is in a week or so, he, he couldn't cope with being with others in, in the unit, went home and not long afterwards, he attempted suicide. Luckily, he was rescued and brought to the hospital again. And now he's seeing me as an outpatient. And he is willing, now more than before, sharing his experiences and also searching some, some help, even though he's not very hopeful or he's not very pervaded by hope anybody can help him. That's him. So he, he, this is the initial stage. Then another patient has experienced four psychotic episodes already. He's 37 now. He has undergone, as I said, um, four, four severe psychotic episodes, and now he's out of it. But he also has difficulties relating to others. He lives uh, with his parents, has almost non-social um, interactions just one friend whom he sees once a week or so, some phone calls with some colleagues, but not, not more. Um, so he lives in that protective environment and he's constantly fearful that um, some evil forces will take him, um, that he will lose control and he will lose uh, conscious capacities to, to remain what he is and not to be um, that, that is, these are not namely fears from his psychotic episodes when he felt he was overtaken by the evil forces. And now he lives um, somehow unprotected. Uh, his inner life, uh, inner um, situation is like that. He feels unprotected from the evil forces uh, that are many times uh, represented by other people. So they both somehow live in the same uh, constant fear um, and um, or uneasiness with any being with other people. So, um, and now comes the question, what is and to what extent they have freedom and they have free choice to lead a life worth living, so to say. Um, and um, Viktor Frankl's um, claim that there is founder of logotherapy and um, or uh, somebody who was um, constantly proclaiming and uh, um, uh, talking about man's search for meaning as his autobiography is entitled. So he, he claimed that there is a degree of freedom in every human situation, even in such a situation that our patients go through. So very constricted. And um, what is possible? Uh, I thought of presenting you through a, a very interesting historical case that you might have heard of, or perhaps not, but he was discovered by a famous anthropologist, Gregory Bateson in 60s, um, namely his um, autobiographical notes were found by Bateson and, and published. Uh, I'm talking about John Thomas Percival. Uh, uh, he lived in 19th century, so 1803 to 1876. He was a British army officer, a nobleman, who was confined to two lunatic asylum, uh, asylums. So he was um, um, from, a, from a well off family. His father was a prime minister, shot to death when he was nine. John Percival, and afterwards he had a brilliant career as an army officer, but then somehow felt army is not his place. He did not feel at home there, so to say. He, he has searched for, for more. He has inscribed to university and then to spiritual quest and um, found a quite radical evangelical sect. Um, uh, proclaiming uh, um, 
talking in tongues and um, performing miracles, being guided by Holy Spirit. And that spiritual quest somehow turned a psychotic turn, uh, made a psychotic turn. So he, he entered a full blown psychosis and was taken by his family to a lunatic asylum. He was there alone, of course, I mean, felt completely alone and abandoned. Uh, and there was these old asylums where there were cold baths and there were some uh, some uh, surgeries under so quite severe and brutal uh, therapeutic um, um, strategies uh, that he undergo underwent. Um, that was he fell ill and was taken to the asylum when he was twenty seven in eighteen thirty, uh, and. There, in that asylum, he found his way. His, he, he realized that he needs to distance himself from delusions. And he also found out that he, need a very, he needs a very strict discipline and effort to come out of that. So he constantly somehow uh, was striving to recollect himself, to be fully present, to, cut, to get back to the everyday life. Um, he felt he needs to synchronize body and, and mind, not to, to get too wild, too psychotic. So strengthening daily routines and, and uh, so very disciplined way of life. Um, not to be distracted and not to, so really to focus, which is, as we said earlier, which is a great difficulty for such a patient, but with a very big efforts, with a strong Trotzmach des Geistes, as um, Frankl always said is needed, uh, he found his way out of that. He convinced the psychiatrists at the asylum that he is good enough he convinced his family to get him out of, of, the, of the asylum. And he then devoted his life after that to take care and to, to uh, he founded an organization, so-called Alleged Lunatics Friend Society, which was the first um, organization to fight for the rights of the inmates of the psychotic, schizophrenic, and other people brought to asylum. So he was one of the uh, major advocates in that movement uh, ever since he came out. Um, so I think with with example um, like his, uh, which is well documented through his notes, uh, we can um, also help um, our patients to, to enter, uh, to, to make these strong um, efforts and endeavors to come out of them. And just to conclude, there is a statement of his. Um, he, he said, whenever my thoughts and hands were most occupied, I became, I suppose, nearest to sound state of mind and consequently more aware of my situation that all or many of the faculties of mind and body should be called into play at one time and above all things that a body should be occupied. So, and he concluded that my soul survived that ruin. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stirler. I'm sure there will be uh, some questions after words for you and also for Professor Cermak. Um, and now, um, before this, we will um, listen to the presentation of Professor Dr. Dr. Walter Schaub, Professor Emeritus of Moral Theology at the University of Graz. Um, and he's also a medical doctor. Uh, his area of research uh, uh, our ethics of medicine, bioethics, spirituality, Christianity in the pluralistic society. And uh, Walter is also a member of National Ethics Committee of Austria. So the floor is yours.
Many thanks for the possibility to share my thoughts with you. I'm the last speaker of this uh, panel and uh, I've prepared, like you can read here, a short, very short presentation, the work of freedom. And I will uh, speak about the theory of freedom of Peter Piri. He, you find it in this book. I will uh, make a short presentation. I will present the theory of freedom to you. And then I will discuss three uh, possible uh, relevant uh, fields where you can study how this theory uh, could be applied to practice. So Peter Piri is, you see him here, a Swiss philosopher and Born 1944 in Bern, is he still living? And he worked and taught at the universities of Bielefeld, Heidelberg, and Berlin. And 2001, uh, the, he published a book, Das Handwerk der Freiheit über die Entdeckung des eigenen Willens. And if you uh, translate it or try to translate it, you could say the work of freedom or the craft work of freedom. And on the detection or yes, discovery of the free will. And uh, if you um, uh, try to, 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 to localize this theory in the present discussion on uh, freedom, it is a compatibilistic theory of freedom. That means uh, this is a field of theories which try to go a third path between determinism and libertarianism. And determinism means in this discussion that every uh, action we have and every thought is totally caused, physically caused by neurobiological events. And libertarianism in this uh, discussion means the contrary, the, they say there is something like absolute freedom uh, we as personal agents have the possibility to cause to cause a, a new chain of, 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 of events in this world by our free will. You start by your free will a new event which is not caused by other physical events and then this goes into the world and goes on. And he, his uh, idea, as he speaks, um, of an appropriated freedom in the German angeeignete Freiheit. This is this uh, uh, where he tries to go a, a third path between. And he says freedom and physical causation of actions can coexist. And in this discussion, this is known this position like as a weak notion of freedom. Uh, they would normally say uh, that uh, a person is free if she, the person can do what he or she wants to do. And they do not go on the metaphysical level if there's a metaphysical person behind or is a metaphysical free will behind, but only say if a person is allowed to, to act according to its own self, uh, normally this person feels free. And he sees this in this line. And the theory for, uh, if you want to know or to, 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 to see the, the history, is in the line of Harry Frankfurt's theory of a second order desires. This was from 1971. Harry Frankfurt said that, uh, that free will uh, is the ability of a living being to develop a second order, higher order desire that governs the first order desire he has or she has. So a living being normally like animals have first order desires, they have impulses, they are in a certain way conscious in animals, but humans are living being who can uh, develop a higher, uh, a higher desire on a higher level, which governs the first order desires and that is the mechanism of freedom, he says. So, Piri has altered this thing, and he, now I present to you the, on one page, on one uh, slide, uh, his concept of this appropriated freedom. So he says, there is a first level of a spontaneous will in us as a primary experience. We experience uh, an, impulse, an impulse in us, or a will. 
And for him, this is not free and totally determined normally, and could be affected by neurobiological processes and informed by genes, education, society, and culture. So we just uh, have it in us. And then there's a level of appropriation in three stages. And he says, uh, there is a level of articulation. If you begin to articulate the impulses and wishes you feel in yourself spontaneously, you get another stance on it. You get another relation to it. If you have articulated it, you can objectivate it. Then understanding for him is the next level. He says, if you, if you refer to some things which have been said there, if you understand that your aggressive uh, behavior uh, is caused by a dopamine, uh, uh, more dopamine as normal, you get another uh, relation to the whole problem and yourself is altered. This is his thesis. And this goes in the direction of freedom in his understanding. If we begin to understand ourselves, uh, only understand, not already have the power to change our behavior, but already understanding is for him a, a step in this work of freedom. And then the, thir the, the third level is identification or non-identification. And in, his, in the, the, the German uh, work, it is the gebilligte the Wille, and you could uh, translate it as a proved or endorsed will. So he says human beings have the possibility or the ability uh, to, to, to understand themselves deeply or the more deeply. And then they can uh, take a stance, they can approve or not approve in their inner life what they have in themselves. And this is the I would say that the, the primary act of freedom, this ability to take a stance on something that I'm feeling in myself. So uh, the, the third level then is the level of a new will and a new self for him as a new self and new will is related. This is more authentic and more free for him. And he says, if you have these three levels, like a circle you are going on, then there is a growth in responsibility for what you do, a growth. So this is a theory which would not say uh, human beings are free or not free, but he says we have a chance to be more free in our behavior. And we have to work. This is the, the idea of this work, that freedom is something that has to be worked out in the course of a life, of a life in working on the determining factors of my life. And what you gain is a growing authenticity. And uh, so, so I, I, I formulate here, freedom as the possibility of restructuring, you could say a new configuration of determining factors. So, so his idea is not that we are free from determining factors, but we have the ability to deal with them in different ways. And this is our, uh, our chance of freedom to, to, to give a new pattern, a new image uh, in the course of our life, in the course of the, the development of ourselves. So there are levels and grades of freedom. I saw this one. So, and I go to the, to the last two um, slides. So a short discussion, uh, not all problems of free will are solved in this theory. So he, I think he cannot explain how this third level identification, non-identification is something I know about myself or I feel in my inner self. So how it comes about, in which sense it is free or also conditioned. So this is a kind of circle. But I think interesting the shift from the focus on causation of actions, as it is normally discussed by free will. So free will is something that causes actions in our, our life to a possible work on determining factors in a conscious level. And then uh, in the center uh, awareness, uh, awareness, the ability to be aware of ourselves, understanding the ability to understand uh, why we are as we are, and the ability to take a stance, to take, uh, to have a new relation in relation to something to say yes or no. 
And so the anthropological ground for freedom would be uh, awareness, consciousness, self-reflection, the, the ability to self-objectivation and the ability of identification, non-identification. And I think this should be further explored in neurobiologically what uh, this uh, event of that I'm identifying with something or not as myself, what, which alters myself in his uh, theory, uh, what this is, uh, how we can understand this step. I want to give three uh, perspectives on practical fields. So we heard already about psychotherapy. I think it is obvious that psychotherapy and uh, consultation are processes where we be articulate our life and where we understand our life in a new way and where we take a stance, where we learn to identify or non-identify with, with certain factors in our life. So you could say that this is a verb of freedom by excellence, uh, where uh, persons or, or, or human beings gain a new self as a basis for a new action. And this would be the, the pathway of freedom in our life. A second uh, glance to the, the individual and the powers of society. Uh, this is sociology. And you, perhaps you know that Michel Foucault uh, uh, spoke of social dispositives with, which exercise power on the subject. The very um, actual thinking so that the, 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 the individual is subjected to dispositives and discourses which uh, uh, have power and which bring about, generate, so to speak, the subject, also the inner will of the subject. And this is the term of subjectification, it's a complicated term, subjectification, which is used by, uh, by, 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 I think by Foucault and also Bröckling and Judith Butler. Uh, and they say, for instance, uh, Bröckling, he says uh, the, in this, uh, book, The Unternehmerische Selbst, Soziologie and Subjektivierungsform, the Entrepreneurial Self, Sociology of the Subjectification Form, so that uh, society brings about an inner subject which wants to uh, optimize itself. And this is a, this, this, this tendency to self-optimization is an effect in this theory of society, of discourses and of external impulses in our education and so on. So if this is, if, if you go in this direction, I think this, they are going very, very deep because Judy Butler, for example, says, you never know why you ask, how, I so you never know why you have, uh, why you are in the way you are, because you don't have this inner transparency because education and these powers uh, are uh, in a, a stage of your life where you're not conscious. I think that the, this uh, theory of freedom could be an answer, an answer that what we can do with these powers of society and discourses, we can make them conscious and we can take a stance against them and we can try to uh, develop an alternative self which is oriented on alternative um, uh, values, so to speak. Yeah. And the spiritual, spirit, as a spiritual religious life, I had the idea once that uh, if you transfer these things, uh, these ideas to the uh, spiritual, to the world of spiritual practice and the search for inner awareness, which is very uh, actual today, you could say that the search for an inner space of awareness where influencing powers become conscious is a very important uh, space for this understanding of freedom. This is the condition for, for becoming a new glance on oneself to experience what is determining my, myself, myself, and then try to gain a new vision of myself. And this is again in line, I think, with the, uh, the central role of discernment of the spirits. And you know that in the Catholic tradition, the discernment of the spirits is a very important motive. And the interesting thing is, I think, that in the discerning discernment of the spirits, 
you are dealing with uh, powers, you're dealing with uh, the energies in your, like Ignatius' understanding and not a rational uh, process of consideration. It's not a rational, it's an uh, that, uh, that effort to, to understand which forces and efforts and powers are within me and in what direction I should go. And this is in line again, I think, with this uh, theory of, of Peter Biri. And I think that Christian freedom, you could say, is not arbitrary free will, but the free affirmation of the power of the spirit, you could say. Uh, so we do not bring uh, ourselves uh, about in a free way. We generate, don't generate ourselves in a free way, but we have the ability to open us for powers or influences which are in our life. And the, 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 the important thing is to do it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, for your presentation. Um, for the first step of our panel discussion, I would like to suggest that every one of speakers can react, can echo uh, to the presentation of others uh, with a comment or a question or uh, some other topic for the further discussion. And I would propose the same order of speakers. So first, Professor Cermak. Uh, maybe your first ideas after hearing your colleagues or to, to go deeper in the discussion we have in this panel. Oh. Yes, I, I realized uh, uh, that uh, when we, uh, uh, when we used, uh, when we use uh, a pathological model of brain functioning, uh, we are doing a risky business, let me to say, um, because um, uh, mm, um, we can uh, clearly argue, argue uh, for the uh, uh, strong impact of brain as such. But uh, if we uh, uh, if we uh, if we follow uh, this uh, uh, neurocognitive uh, uh, science, science, uh, it could be easily uh, uh, reduced, complex, and the whole life of a human being uh, into brain functioning. Uh, what is important uh, in our our research and in in, in uh, elaborated of our ideas about free will, also in the in, in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, psychological or psychiatric uh, assessment or, or, uh, or treatment, um, it is, um, it is uh, 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 you know, re realization that, that uh, uh, the life is a dynamic curse, um, um, that we, we live by, uh, uh, that, that we live uh, uh, around the people we came across on our life course uh, and uh, that the relations, relationships with, with people are important for our experience and that, that, that there, is, there is a process in, in which uh, uh, the free will uh, uh, is striving, striving to to, to uh, grasp the, the sense of uh, sense of our life uh, so it is just just a, just a short a short commentary to uh, to uh, professor Skodlar and and uh, my uh, myself um, myself uh, presentation and um, uh, I was very uh, you know uh, concerned with the uh, with the presentation of uh, professor Schaub because it was so uh, so deep and so uh, so psychologically deep uh, view of uh, of uh, um, free will um, and uh, 
And I, I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Shaw uh, whether there are some uh, uh, some studies uh, which are based uh, upon the uh, theory of Peter Bieri, because because for, for example uh, the levels of uh, uh, levels of uh, uh, appropriated uh, freedom. Uh, are very well articulated in order to be opera, operationalized uh, into, into research. And um, in this context, I would like to uh, mention also a book of Slovak uh, philosopher, uh, Professor Peter Wolek, who uh, it might be uh, known for, for Czech and Slovak, uh, Slovak colleagues in the auditorium, uh, which, is, which is called a uh, human being, uh, free will and neurosciences, and uh, it is a prolific argumentation for free will uh, against the uh, reductionism of uh, of neurosciences. And I think that uh, th this book was written uh, written in Slovak uh, language, and I think uh, that um, that uh, it uh, should be translated into English or into German because because uh, it is it is clearly elaborated. Uh, Argues for a free a free will. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for uh, the question. Maybe uh, Walter will uh, answer your question after uh, the, uh, when uh, we hear the first reaction of Borut Skodler. Um, what are your thoughts after hearing your colleagues? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mentioned the first reaction to, um, to Professor Cermak's um, description, and I don't know or have dealt with some severely traumatized patients myself. And um, um, we know um, in recent times uh, so much more about stress related and trauma related brain damages or brain consequences, as well as on the other side, what um, Professor Cermak presented well, how, how it influences uh, one's psychic life and post-traumatic uh, life and how much of a work is needed. I was impressed by the, by the drawings. Um, we, of course, also um, encounter that in drawings of our patients. And we also see um, how they can, with different expressions, be it verbal or nonverbal, how they slowly and with, with great effort, again, as I presented in, in my three cases, how, how they manage then to bring some pieces of mosaic then together and to, to to build up a kind of a, of a yeah, autobiography or, or life story of, of themselves. And that relates to, the, to Professor Schaub's um, uh, presentation, um, because I, I, he also said that it's, um, just I repeat, um, I think in a way that all the, three, all the levels of Free freedom and free will are uh, incorporated, and especially, I, I think I talked about the third level a lot um, through presenting Percival's case. Um, he, um, I mean, of course, the first two were embedded in his uh, traumatic. Um, he he was uh, some um, indications show that he was present when his father was shot in the House of Commons. Um, so by a by a, a dissatisfied farmer or worker um, due to some political decisions of of his father, so he was traumatized. He was then um, having apparently this very um, yeah psychotic vulnerability, and what he then made out of that, or how he he struggled with that, was clearly an effort and. Um, um, he, he was having a work of freedom, or how was the, the, the phrase that Professor Schaub and uh, Peter Beery uses. So um, I think it's um, clearly, it has implications for, for therapy. In Percival's case, it was apparently an autotherapy, autopsychotherapy, but 
I think insights from that, from all the three levels can be very fruitful also for, for psychotherapy, which was already indicated in the Professor Sharp's presentation. That would be my first reaction. Thank you, Professor Skodler. And I would like to invite Walter Schaub to, to share his first comments to, to others, and maybe to answer the question of German. Okay. And then I, I, after you, uh, you can share your question, your comments, so the audience will be invited to come here. So we'll prepare the first and most courageous, you can already stay in line here for, the, for your comments. Yes, I, I think I already said it that I think the theory I wanted to present the date today to present today is um, um, that it goes in line with our experience of of of, of, of growing whole in a thera therapeutic process, and uh, I also have the association of a growing uh, in German sovereignty sovereignty. 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 Mm -hmm. to, we have about ourselves in our life. And that uh, and that also I think religion uh, is in service of this. And also medicine is in service of this because I'm also have studied medicine. So I see there are congruence, I think, in this theory on different levels. And the only thing for me is uh, uh, I, I really I really think that consciousness is a very important thing, consciousness, that the ability to uh, have a representation of ourselves and uh, deal with this representation to, can, can, can uh, this is a very, very important thing in this uh, discussion and for freedom, I think. And uh, the question of you, I didn't, could you, could you repeat uh, the question, Professor Chermak? I, or the biography, if yes. you have some, some example. example of, of the literature. Or, so, or no, or no. We will, uh... no, I have to study it for myself more. But I, I, we, we, in, in philosophy, there's a, a, a lot of discussion about narratives and the importance of narratives. And the, the, that we, as human beings, we need we need a consistent narrative in our life. And you know that many are saying that uh, we often uh, construct a narrative which is not really real because we have this desire for consistency, and so we do also fakes. But I think. And the desire for a consistent narrative in our life is even this desire for, for, for wholeness, I think mm -hmm. it's in a spiritual way. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very important drive in our human existence. And, and, and we should also, if we know that not all narratives are really true and not realistic, uh, uh, I think we as a culture also, in reality, we also we always try to find narratives for our history as human mankind who are consistent and, and uh, for how people could live together in a, in a, in a peaceful world. And so, so I, I, I think this is a very important um, uh, point. Uh, now the floor is open for, for the discussion. So from the audience, somebody would like to start with a comment. Uh, so this is also, I would say, the, the, the last discussion we have in plenary. So this is a conclusion of our meeting. If you have uh, so some, some ideas, some proposals, uh, also maybe for, for good literature, good books, good uh, uh, examples, you can share your proposal with the audience. <coughs> Nenad, please come here and... Uh, hello, my question would be to Professor Schaub uh, with this theory of, of freedom. Uh, I wonder how adequate do you 
think this this theory is because as you were explaining it i was thinking you know when you're moving from this uh point of spontaneous freedom to actual freedom uh it involves something that perhaps academics are involved uh, uh most especially maybe people in humanities in terms of you know reflection and and having actually time for reflection uh and taking a critical distance to these factors like what I got from society and edu education and so on. So if you would follow that line of argument, then you would come to the conclusion that perhaps academics are the most free people, right? Or maybe monks who can maybe have time and resources to reflect on that. And then, of course, on the other hand, uh, experience would deny that kind of conclusion because we are probably not the most free people on average, uh, or we don't, we do not seem to be more free than maybe other people. So would you find that theory actually adequate? Are there, you were pointing out that there's a problem with that. How do you come to that? You know, how is this happening actually? But uh, what is, is there any alternative here? Uh, do you have any su suggestions how this actually works and how do we avoid this conclusion that we as academics are not then you know, because then the theory seems self-serving in a sense, mm -hmm. developed by acad academic to to somehow legitimate us in as most free. So, thank you. Uh, one answer would be that uh, the, the this uh, stage is must not be in this uh, emphatic uh, emphatic sense uh, reflective, so that we could take recourse to something like conscience, also that. It is enough to what today many are stressing in the in the, in the, in the religious field. It is enough to to have a, a feeling for oneself and to gain a feeling for oneself, in contrast to outer uh, influences. And I think that the next the the, the the next thing is that the theory from Peter Biere you have to, uh, it, it's very pessimistic about how free we are normally, that is right. As he would say, uh, in his sense, the most time of our life, we are not free. Yes. Or you could say metaphysically, uh, freedom is a, is, a, is, a, is a possibility of our life on a metaphysical level, but the realization of freedom is very uh, uh, precarious. Yeah. And I think when you read this Judith Butler things and then the sociology and so on, and European new biology, uh, there are many arguments that normally we are not in this sense free. We are, we are reacting because we have uh, mechanisms of reaction. We are thinking in a way, if you, you study this uh, uh, Judith Butler and the discourses, they want to show that your thinking is also dependent on the notions you have in your culture and that you are not free in a culture to think in another way because you don't have the resources and that you uh, uh, have to wait or have to you know, try to make the step to have a feeling that the, perhaps the reality is more than our notions are. Mm -hmm. If you would do this step, then you, you could see with the theory, you have a, a step in the direction of freedom because you are questioning uh, the, the, the framework in which you are thinking. But I would agree with you that I, I, I'm not through with this theory because it's only one aspect I think which is important. And what I wanted to stress is that it is important because uh, which I said that we just, uh, they, they understand freedom as working on the determining factors of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I would say that has something for it as it is an important thing. How free other, how free children are if they acting in their everyday life, I don't know, but yeah. This is, if you know the discussion about freedom, you see it depends on what you, for you is freedom. For Peter Biere, he says free is 
um, he would also say, uh, freedom is the self, if you can follow yourself, if you, there's no tension between yourself and your action, then you feel free. This is a starting point for him. And it, this would say that in a paradisischer Urzustand, in a paradisischen Urzustand, we don't have the problem of freedom because you are totally in congruence with yourself. And the other direction I know, and I don't want, also is the direction to, of this act as an agent causation, I, I mentioned. I don't, and I, I just wanted to say that this is, a, for me, an important way of thinking. But, okay. Would anybody of other two speakers yes, borrowed? Yeah, I would like to to add something or to so um, I have a counter argument of the argument implied in the question, if I understood it well, um, uh, saying that um, people who who have no time or, or so resources to reflect and to yeah to go. Um, with uh, uh, degrees of freedom to grow in freedom. I if I understood it correctly, and if I get uh, Peter Beery's theory, um, which I do not know well, um, but I would just, well, my argument is that um, many people traumatized, schizophrenic, and many others who, who have gone through different uh, limit situations, great, great situation or other difficult situations in their lives, they are inclined to reflect a lot. They are hyper-reflective, many of them, much more than many academics, mm -hmm. I would say. They cannot stop. Their problem is how to distance themselves from those reflections and how to distance themselves from the fears and, and stories that grow out of fears, uh, psychotic or non-psychotic ones. Um, so they need that, that effort a lot. And they, 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 it is the struggle for them that they cannot avoid. So I believe, believe that such theory can work for them. Oh, at least elements of it, as I understood them, are very relevant for, for them as well. Perhaps even more than for the academics, because academics are more inclined, I would say, to find their diasporas call it gehäuse, so, um, the the refuge. Um, um, what would be the, the English term for that? So shelters, um, thought uh, thought shelters. Um, they are um, they are less um, perhaps. Um, I mean, I'm now. Um, over generalizing, of course, there are many academics who have undergone very difficult life situations and are also forced to, to, to go through their struggles, but they, they are perhaps, so ac academic status does not, uh, and even um, monastic status does not prevent a, a person not to grow in freedom. And many people outside are forced to do so. I don't, if, I don't know if I'm clear, but that would be my, my just reaction to, the, to that discussion. Okay, uh, please, for your reaction. Marian Machinek. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, make a comment to the theory of Biri. I have some problems with the, uh, with the presumptions that only some people are really free. Um, because if only some people are really free, maybe we cannot hold somebody accountable for her or his crimes. Uh, the precondition of holding somebody accountable is the presumption of freedom and uh, the ability of act freely and consciously. So we would say maybe someone commit a crime because he was not really free. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, 
Uh, it's right that this theory is very pessimistic about, it's more pessimistic than in the, in the perspective, like we saw, saw already, if uh, persons are really free in their normal acting. acting. Yeah. And uh, the, you could uh, turn it around and, and ask, how do you know that you are free? If you, 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 I can give you more reasons that you are not have been free coming to this conference than reasons that it was a free act of you to come here. No? You can, we had another theory with the reason, many philosophers I think say that uh, re, uh, so freedom is the ability to give reasons for our, 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 our behavior. And so you say, if I can reason, I have a ground for my action, I can articulate, and then there follows an action when I do this. But I think this is okay. It has the same uh, weakness a little bit like, uh, like this theory, because it, 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 in this sense, you are free if you can reflect really and can give grounds. And I think, I thought about it, I think it's also compatible a little bit with Spiri's theory, the stages of uh, articulation, reflection, and uh, evaluation of, my, of, my, of the things you can transfer and reasoning. You can say the spontaneous will in me is a certain value in my life. I spontaneously accept or I have accepted. I'm a religious person, for instance. This is important for me. Huh? Then you understand that uh, in, in reality, this is your education. Then you are thinking on what is now. I'm really believing or not. Is this free or not free? Because I'm educated in this way. No? And then this is all not, uh, so this is a reasoning also, I think, of grounds and evaluating them in this sense of Peter Piri. So I think that the, the, imp, uh, the, the account of Peter Piri and the account of freedom as acting according to some reasons and reflection, I think this is compatible yeah. for me. Is, but, yeah, okay. Okay, next comment, Andrea Vicini. Thank you, thank you very much for your presentations and the conversation. If uh, I can, I would like to express a reaction to what you are presenting. While the conversation seems to go in the direction of, am I free as an individual? Why I was highlighting in what you three presented the fact that maybe we need to think of what are the social conditions that allow us or not promote or inhibit our ability of being free. If I can use a, an image from another field of scientific dialogue and research, in global health, scholars reflect on the social determinants of health, even the political determinants of health, That's it, that is, the way we build our cities, the way in which we educate ourselves, the way in which we organize our social life influences our uh, way of experiencing health or makes it difficult for us to be healthy. And in describing the situation of a traumatized girl, you're telling us that there is a social context that abused this woman. So we need to reflect on everything that concerns gender, for example, violence, family relations, and so on. When we think about uh, uh, the events that uh, determine or influence or cause the psychotic crisis in the case that you presented, we are thinking about uh, what was happening there that was outside of the control of the person. And finally, when we think about freedom, you ended your presentation indicating that we need to think of what are the social dynamics in society. So my uh, takeout in a way, is that while we have this tendency of always focusing on the subject when we reflect on human freedom and free will, we risk missing the whole set of reflections that are inseparable and that concerns factors that we, in many cases, we cannot control, that are part of the social fabric, they are part of the political arrangements of the race uh, interactions and social arrangements even the possibility 
or impossibility of working as an influence on my own understanding and experience of freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vicini, for your comment. Would you like to read? Yes. Could you say again or more what would how society should be to allow freedom? What what is this? Is this more the that we have security or goods for is uh, that our life can flourish, or is it uh, a certain mental state of the society? What would you say for you? Is that Is that, yeah. oh. I would say that we cannot separate the two. Yeah. That if we focus only on one, we are showing a reductionist tendency in ourselves, thinking that my freedom depends only on who I am. Well, even, even as believers, we don't believe that. We affirm that our freedom, who we are, even in our bodily nature is because of God's grace. So it is a relational understanding, even of my own identity. Even more when I think of us as political animals, animals in a social context, society changes us, society influences us. In a capitalist society, in a Marxist society, in a society where there is inequity. Of course, this has implication of who I am. So it seems to me we are risking or losing the richness of our reflection in sciences and humanities, if we think that the issue of freedom simply can be reduced of what empowers my personal freedom without considering what's happening around me, what's happening to others that uh, as a tragic, in many cases, influence on the possibility of freedom. Uh, Angelica first, Angelica Walser, and then uh, Günther Fiert. And then we will have also uh, last, uh, the possibility for the last uh, conclusion, concluding words of our panelists. So Angelica, please, the floor is yours. So thank you. Thank you for all the presentations now, of course. Uh, and one question to Walter Schaub. Um, Thank you very much for for this um, for this insight of Peter Biri about the gradual understanding of freedom. And now comes my question. I I have the impression, listening to you, uh, to everybody here now, this is all a kind of storytelling somehow, and uh, everyone tells a different story of freedom. And would you? Would you um, agree with me that, um, because I'm always, I, I search this line to draw between therapy and enhancement. And would you agree with me that um, the, the point is, if someone is enabled to tell his own story, um, like this, uh, the, the three levels you were mentioned in Peter Beery's concept, this is a kind of, of moral identity story, it's my impression. And, and um, therapy starts to help people to tell their own story, <laughs> while enhancement um, tells more the story of other people, uh, society, for example. W would you agree with this? <laughs> Uh, I would, I would say that in this account of Peter P, there was uh, uh, very often the word authentic. It's, it's also this is a, in the discussion on freedom. There is a line, a direction. They say freedom. Uh, so freedom is liberty is authenticity, drawing in authenticity. And he goes in this direction. He would say, uh, I would. We should in a in a in a context where we are constantly influenced by others and societies. We should develop a uh, most authentic story of ourselves, possible, the most possible authentic story. So I know there are many philosophers that would say this is not possible, but means authentic. Yeah. But uh, I think that in a Christian anthropology, I think we have, uh, there is the possibility to, 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 to do this. 
And I would think that it comes about with wholeness. If you, this picture, this new picture, if you have a picture of yourself that this, uh, you can live very good with and in, in all dimensions and in all contexts, which it is very much, what, what do you want more than, than so for me, uh, liberty or, or the unfolding of, of life is very much uh, growing, um, living, growing life and growing fertility to, to, to others and interactions and the possibility, the gain on these, I would say, is a criteria, a criteria for, for this, uh, these processes. So before I give the word to uh, Günther Fiert, I would like to read the message of our uh, president, Sigrid Müller. Yes. So I would like, uh, Sigrid Müller wrote, I would like to express a thank you. I'm very grateful for all the contributions which show not only a human approach to human beings in their personal development, but also the different, the different sciences do come to similar results. Um, combining this, Uh -huh. uh, combining this to the contribution of neurosciences, I have learned that personal effort and help from outside are important for producing changes. But these changes are possible due to the uh, plasticity of our brain. Thank you to all the speakers of today. Okay, uh, Günther Fiert. Okay. Okay. Thank you for a, a short uh, question to Walter Schaub. Uh, uh, I regret again my poor English, uh, I never learned it enough. I could not follow all the details. Uh, um, and I regret also that uh, we as moral theologians uh, do not reflect deep enough in the last time about a conscience. And conscience is a synthetic word, conscientia, syntheresis, and also in the Slavic language, it is always a synthetic verb. What is, what is the synthesis in the, in the conscience, freedom of conscience? Uh, how is uh, freedom in the conscience based? And uh, as uh, it was said, uh, our, it's a lifelong process of internalization. We have not uh, an abstract uh, conscience view. It's a lifelong, for me, more than 81 years process of internalization of all the influences and to react to this, uh, how I internalize. Uh, you mentioned uh, Judith Butler. Can you explain a little more uh, when the verb, I, I remind the analysis of process of internalization and to connect it with the concept of concept? A conscience. So I don't know if I understand Judith Butler really, but I, I wrote an article and read her, her books. And she is, uh, her concept is, she refers to psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, auto authors, French authors. And her pictures, um, what was it? Uh, 
The Psychic of Power, I think. This is a book where she uh, develops how our subjectivity uh, grows. And very important for her is the, the image that there always is another who addresses me with words, who addresses me with powerful sentences. And she says she comes from Hegel, uh, originally, inter interestingly, from Hegel. And um, her, her, I think her, her, her final thought or, or basic thought is uh, that we, to exist in the public sphere as a subject, you have to be acknowledged by others. And this process of mutual acknowledgement uh, presupposes also uh, a language with which you can address the other and experience the other, understand the other and so on. But this language is also something in her eyes, which is uh, a powerful, a, a power in your childhood life. You internalize all the things and all the, 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 the models the, 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 of, of reality, of self-understanding, the words, the notions uh, of, the, of the culture. And these are the, 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 the Bausteine, the bricks, bricks by which you are constructing then your inner, inner, the inner reality of your subjectivity. And this inner reality of your inner subjectivity is in this way the effect of this multiple be addressed as a child. And later you don't know this. Yeah? You, have, you, 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 you get an inner life which is structured according to the notions and structures of these discourses of your parents, of your culture. And for her and for many who are thinking in this way, there is no escape for this, no escape. Because you are always too late, so to speak, you're always too late. But I'm not so pessimistic. I think that's for me. And if you want to, to think freedom in this context, it begins with consciousness. It begins with consciousness and the ability to, 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 to make a critique, hinterfragen, what is this hinterfragen? To reflect or to, to, to the ability, I often think on the, on the notion of, the, of the, the, the mind of Karl Rahn and others in transcendental uh, theology, they say uh, the Geist, Geist, the spirit, yeah, is, is always the, the all, the whole, the whole in something. So if you would say, we in our consciousness as, as, uh, as living beings who have a mind, we have a uh, Vorverständnis. We have an, a pre-understanding of, 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 of wholeness. And this enables us to, uh, to, to always question something that has uh, influenced us, to re-question things, I think. And this is the process, I would say, if you, I the, you are in the, the frame of Judith Butler. We are human beings who have the ability to constantly go beyond something that has influenced us. Because we, in principle, we can think uh, that is not all what I am. There is a possible other, a wider space. Yeah. And this would, I don't know how neurologists would, I think they also think about this, but the ability to, to, to I think it's also this, this, this element of self-objectivation. Self if I can uh, represent myself as an object, in this moment, I am taking a, a step back. And in this moment, I can think, could it be another way? Could it be in another way, perhaps? And I think animals don't have this possibility. And so one understanding could be the freedom or, 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 grown, or growing in your self-understanding and growing of the self is, is this dynamic to constantly re-imagine or restructure uh, yourself or your understanding from the world, how it is in real, de facto, de facto. De facto. Okay, I would like now to conclude this panel discussion, giving the uh, last word to, to our panelists to 
to uh, conclude our our uh, discussion with some last thoughts you have you would like to share with the audience uh, professor Cermak. thank you um, what i would say to the end of this round table um, I, I definitely um, agree that there are many uh, influences, many impacts, many uh, determinations uh, coming from social, uh, political and uh, cultural environment. But at the same time, a human being as an individual is not only a toy in the web of uh, social forces. Uh, if I uh, if I come back to the example of uh, um, freedom in childhood, uh, the freedom in childhood could be conceived as a as a more spontaneous kind of freedom, and uh, the more the child is able to mentalize his life and take uh, into account uh, perspective of other people, uh, the more reflective his or her uh, free will is. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's all what I would like to say at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cermak. Uh, Professor Skodlar. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was uh, uh, very um, uh, happy with the, with the discussion it went in many directions. I totally agree with Professor Vicini also how important it is to reflect and include the social um, and other uh, dimensions in reflecting the freedom. Um, and um, I would just um, add one, one thing that I haven't stressed um, in, in my presentation that all of, my, of the three cases I presented were three individuals with, with um, deep spiritual quests and what also Professor Schaub showed in the that in especially for the third level spiritual quests are very important and um, it reminds me of a quote of an American psychoanalyst psychotherapist of psychotic disorders who said if there weren't if there were if spirituality has not existed before had not existed before people with psychosis would have invented it so I think it's deeply ingrained in in them and also um, the Percival, the patient, I, the, the uh, gentleman I presented, he said, the almighty allowed my mind to become a ruin under sickness, delusions of a religious nature and treatment contrary to nature. And as I said before, my soul survived that ruin and he remained spiritual questing person uh, onwards. It was a life transforming experiences experience for him so i think that's deeply ingrained and i i can see that in um in many patients so that was my thank you professor Boruch -Kodler thank you. and walter you, you would like to to end with this okay so i would like to thank you uh, all of three panelists and also the audience for this very uh, uh, enriching discussion.